Hello, everybody. Well, we're in uh, Luke, so please turn to chapter 15. Uh, we've come that far in our study. Uh, we're more than halfway through, and, uh, but we're still in the midst of a larger section in which uh, Luke is portraying Jesus on this journey, a steadfast journey to Jerusalem. Uh, Luke has recorded in verse 22, I'm going to go, go back the last few chapters, uh, verse 22 of chapter 13, how he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, his earthly ministry would find its uh, climax there. But as the verse describes, there was still much for him uh, to accomplish as he made his way there. There was nonstop uh, teaching and, and healing, and um, there was the calling of disciples to himself. In chapter 14 and verse 25, Luke described large crowds going along with Jesus. And that necessitated, you remember, a kind of winnowing uh, ministry on the Lord's part as he continued to advise all these would-be uh, disciples who were following him uh, to count the cost of what following after him would entail. And the 14th chapter closed with the Lord's terse admonishment, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so now you see, looking at that first verse, of chapter 15, as the chapter opens, a specific company is brought forth uh, in Luke's narrative who have come to him for that purpose, to hear. Uh, but they are sinners who have come. And the hated tax collectors, as Luke describes them, uh, coming near him now uh, to listen to him. So let's pick back up with the second verse of Luke chapter 15, uh, both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, <clears throat> saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. That's gonna require a little bit of explanation there and I will in a few minutes. Or what woman, if she has, uh, so here's the second parable of, th of three in this chapter. Or what woman, if she has 10 silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then as you know, uh, the Lord continues. He said, a man had uh, two sons. And you know uh, that story. We'll get to that, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks. God speaks to us in his word. Uh, the Bible is autobiographical in a sense, in that in it, uh, God uh, tells us about himself. Uh, there are so many things he tells us about himself. He tells us about his many wonderful uh, attributes. Uh, he tells us about his work as the creator of all things, uh, his divine decree, his many wonderful providences, 
and how he superintends all things according to the counsel of his own will. We learn a lot about God when we read uh, the scriptures. But more perhaps than that, God reveals himself, and this is really the theme of the lesson today. God reveals himself in his word as one who finds great joy in pursuing and reaching rescuing lost sinners. And we see this from the very beginning. Uh, Adam and Eve, uh, they were created uh, innocent, uh, but they became lost sinners after disobeying God's command in the garden. Uh, they knew they had sinned and they knew what the punishment was because God had told them uh, they would surely die. Uh, but it wasn't Adam and Eve who ran to God to save them and, and, rest, and restore them. Uh, you know, reading that critical passage in Genesis chapter three, uh, they actually hid from, from God. Uh, and it was he who went uh, walking in the garden and he called out to them, where are you? And then he made sacrifice, God did, in order to restore them and, and gave to them the promise of the future seed of the woman who would re re rescue their posterity. Abraham uh, was a mighty man of faith and God made a covenant with him to give him a promised land to make a great nation of him, to bless all the families of the earth uh, through him. Uh, but that was only after uh, God sought him out of Haran in Ur of the Chaldees and commanded him to go and fulfill uh, the promises. Before that, Abraham was a pagan. According to Joshua in Joshua 24 two, Abraham and his family served other gods. But the Lord sought him out of that pagan land and, and rescued him. While Abraham became a great a, a man of great faith, there's no indication that Abraham initiated that relationship. Abraham's uh, nephew, uh, Lot, uh, lived a terribly reckless life, but God moved heaven and earth to snatch him from the danger he had put himself in and to rescue him from the devastation that he poured on Sodom and Gomorrah. And we could name many more of these Old Testament saints whom the Lord sought out to save uh, from their propensity to sin. But moving forward, let's move forward uh, centuries. We come to the, uh, the apostles, the, the great uh, apostles. Jesus sought them all out, uh, each of them individually, one by one, and brought salvation to them, uh, making them his specially appointed servants. And that would include the Apostle Paul, uh, accosted on the Damascus road by him, whom he had been persecuting by his spirit, making his life's desire from that point on to know him and the power of his resurrection and to serve him uh, as the uh, minister to the Gentiles. And now here in our gospel, uh, this major section will culminate in uh, chapter 19. Uh, we're in 15. It's going to culminate in chapter 19 with Jesus entering Jericho and spying another uh, tax collector perched up in a sycamore tree. And Jesus will take hold of him as well and, and bring salvation to his house, concluding the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. But now in our chapter 15, we have uh, the entire 32 uh, verses devoted to this theme. Here are three wonderful parables of our Lord that bring out the joy of God when a lost sinner is found, uh, rendering this chapter one of the most beloved of the Christian church. A lost beloved sheep, a lost precious coin, a lost son of a father, all found and saved, and heaven rejoices. I'm not the only one who has thought, I wish we could study them all in one lesson, for the message of each is one, expressed in various ways over the years by its students, 
the Gospel for the Outcasts, that's I. Howard Marshall. The Father's Yearning Love for the Lost, that's William Hendrickson. Jesus Seeking and Rescuing of Sinners Brings Joy to God, that's Walter, Walter Liefeld. Luke was not just a physician and historian, he was an excellent editor as, as well. He made sure his readers uh, caught the flow of this segment of Jesus' uh, journey. Immediately after recording the Lord's, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He sets the ironic table. Uh, it is not the Jewish leaders, the, the Pharisees and the scribes who begin to listen up. Uh, it was an entirely different company of tax collectors and sinners who had come near to him for that very purpose. Uh, the new context then is Jesus uh, receiving sinners and eating with them. Uh, the tax collectors, uh, this group, you, you know about the tax collectors, but uh, they were considered by every self-respecting Israelite to be at the very least, sinners, if possible worse, the scum of the earth. Uh, they were the Roman occupiers' toadies, doing their enemies' dirty work and cheating and illegally profiting from their fellow countrymen while they were, while they were at it. They were a despised tribe of their own category. While this broader class that Luke uh, labels simply as sinners uh, covered all those living amongst the communities as disinterested in the standards established by the rabbinical class, living their lives according to their own uh, standards. The Pharisees and scribes were bound by their own laws from having fellowship with these tax collectors and sinners, from sharing any kind of table uh, fellowship, meals, uh, with such as those, while Jesus, and the language makes this clear, habitually experienced and even enjoyed uh, such occasions. That's something for us to ponder, maybe not right now, but uh, he sought them out. He enjoyed uh, being with them. Well, the self-righteous Pharisees complained, this man receives sinners and eats with them. They were correct. Uh, these were the outcasts, and rather than despising them, Jesus was drawn to them. Uh, his action was abhorrent to the religious leaders. Uh, this man, uh, they spat the words out, their tone dripping with contempt. In contrast to the Lord, however, their attitude was scandalous. You wouldn't have known it but they were the under shepherds of the ultimate shepherd of the sheep, God himself, who for centuries through the prophets had made known his desire to care for and preserve his own precious sheep, Israel. He had spoken to them through uh, the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 34, a chapter you're probably familiar with. Prophesy against the shepherds, he had commanded. Uh, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? Uh, you have not strengthened the sick, or bound up the broken, or, nor brought back the scattered, nor have you sought for the lost. Uh, my flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. This is a long passage I'm reading from, so I'm reading excerpts, but he goes on to say, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. I will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. 
And so in these verses in Ezekiel 34, above all, God describes himself as a shepherd. He is a shepherd. So with that background, Jesus responded to them first with the parable of the shepherd and his lost sheep. It's a simple story of the joy of a shepherd who searches and finds uh, one of a larger number of sheep who had gotten lost, and then the Lord applies it to the joy that God feels when a lost sinner has been found and has, been re and has repented. For those listening, uh, there was nothing uncommon in uh, the scene. A hundred sheep was a normal size uh, flock fold at the time, and at evening time, the shepherd would count his sheep to see if any one uh, sheep was uh, missing, if any had wandered away. <clears throat> Once he discovered one was missing, uh, he would have left the other 99 in the care of a family member or a, a neighbor. It illustrates the value uh, the shepherd places on this individual, this one sheep. Though it had wandered away and become lost and, and separated from the flock, he did not uh, give up on it, but rather sought to find it. It would, might perhaps be wounded, or if, if not, at least frightened, uh, because separated from uh, the other sheep. And the shepherd will not rest until he has found it. In the parable, we just read it. No one forces the shepherd to seek after the lost sheep. It's he who takes the initiative in the same way that our own good shepherd uh, takes the initiative to uh, find us and bring us into the safety of his arms. Many of our, ourselves, I'm sure, can identify uh, with this picture and track in our minds, our, our history, uh, how the Lord sought after us and how he arranged heaven and hell uh, to take hold of us and bring us to our senses and give us new birth and, and the knowledge of salvation found in Christ. He found us. And here also is perseverance. Uh, how does a good shepherd deal with a lost sheep? Well, here's the answer. Uh, what man among you, Jesus challenges them in such a circumstance of a lost sheep, would not go after the one which is lost until he finds it? The implied answer coming from the true good shepherd himself is not one good shepherd would refrain from securing the lost sheep's safety. Now, here is the consolation for lost sinners. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. He loves, loves lost sinners and treats them as a good shepherd treats one of his lost sheep. He relentlessly seeks for them until he finds them. And once found, this group knows, as John 10 declares, he'll make them secure forever. Uh, they'll never perish. Uh, no one will snatch them out of his hand. So here in Jesus' parable, we see, uh, I like to think of it, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. That's the picture in verse 5. Look there. When he has found the lost sheep, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. One of the early church's most familiar statues uh, was of a shepherd holding a, a lamb or a sheep around his neck and upon his shoulders. I have an olive wood replica of one that someone gave me that sits on one of the shelves in my study, except I, I moved it and put it on my desk. Inspiration for this. It's this beautiful image, and I've looked at it many times over uh, in preparation for teaching this. Uh, a sheep that had been lost and fearful. Uh, my, my little statue 
his head, it's almost as if he's nodded off, he's resting in peace. But he didn't know where to go to find safety, and now he's secure, he's warm in the arms of his shepherd, not even able, if he wanted to, uh, to run away and, and be lost again. For the shepherd held him firmly in his hands. And then you look at the shepherd, and his, his own eyes uh, straight ahead and, and resolute as he brings the lamb to the safety of the flock. There is the note of, of triumph, but also equally of affection. There will be no lost sheep on this shepherd's watch. Jesus meant it as a prophetic image portraying his own love for lost sinners and the task before him on his way to Jerusalem. The prophet Isaiah had written of such a sacrificial servant. We're going to hear more from Dan this morning out of the passage in 1 Peter. But in Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. As the Lord uh, paused in his journey and ministered <coughs> to, <coughs> excuse me, to these uh, tax collectors, and sinners, it was a most appropriate parable. And the Apostle Peter would one day look back upon the image as he wrote of Christ's ultimate rescue of lost sinners and applied it to his readers, reminding them, you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. But we must not miss uh, the joy of the shepherd in the triumph of the rescue. When he found it, we read here, he, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. This might be uh, the real climax of the parable. You might not think so, but I think it might be. Uh, for Jesus intended it to communicate to those proud and pious uh, Pharisees that what really pleased God was not their empty and vain self-righteousness, their pristine religiosity, but the seeking after and receiving lost sinners into his spiritual fold. It is heaven's concern. That's what the Lord now emphasizes in the seventh verse. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This is what the Lord underscores as he brings this first parable to a close. Uh, the joy of God upon, upon finding a lost sinner in a state of repentance. It is heaven's concern and it is heaven's joy to see a sinner repent and receive God's salvation. So we must not forget Jesus' audience this day. Who was he really talking to? Uh, they were the self-righteous Pharisees and the scribes standing aloof outside the gathering of tax collectors and sinners, peeking in, as it were, tisk tisking. Did I say that right? Tisk tisking, as they observed this strange rabbi consorting with their moral inferiors. But this question arises from Jesus' words, who are those he calls the righteous persons who need no repentance? I chose not to spend a lot of time on this. There's other things more important than our passage, but was it an accusation, uh, a veiled reference to the Pharisees standing there? Who, these the righteous persons who need no repentance? But they were only righteous 
in their own eyes and found no need for repentance. Their righteousness was a guise that brought no joy to God. Or did Jesus have in mind rather those sheep already safely in the fold uh, who had not wandered off into the danger of sin, blatant, blatant sin and a alienation? Uh, they could be considered you know, righteous in that way so that the Lord was expressing his relative joy over finding the lost sheep in comparison to the ones already safely in the fold, whichever he intended. Uh, we need not allow the question to cloud the main point. Uh, what elements, I want you to notice and think, what elements are common to all three parables, including uh, that one of the prodigal son, which you know, so we can talk about it. Uh, the key words found in all three parables tell us the lost, the owner who feels the loss, the pursuit, uh, going after the lost one and finding it, the joy upon the recovery, and lastly, and we should not overlook it, the repentance of the sinner. All three parables, even those mentioning a sheep and a, and a coin, uh, but especially we'll find of the prodigal son uh, bring repentance uh, to the fore. The recovery of the loss will never be accomplished apart from repentance. More than one writer has seen in this section of Luke's gospel, it's heart. For here Luke's great theme of God's love and mercy for lost sinners and his call for repentance and faith come forth in full symphonic harmony. And if such is heaven's concern, ought it not also be our concern? If it was scandalous for the sham shepherd standing outside the door to neglect the ones God sought after until found and then rejoiced at their rescue, is it not also a scandal for me, for you and I, to be so distracted by the world or religion even or cold heartedness that we leave them to their terrible fate, lost and forsaken with no one to search after them. Well, I've left less time for us to consider the second of Jesus's parables, the one concerning the lost coin. Uh, but though the elements of the parable are different, a precious coin instead of a sheep, a needy woman instead of a shepherd, a completely different kind of search, the central theme is the same, joy over the lost found. God does not wait passively for sinners to come to him, but actively seeks them out. And so from a story about a seeking shepherd, uh, the Lord transitions to a seeking woman. We may infer that she was a needy woman for whom every penny mattered because the loss of one of her 10 silver coins caused her to drop everything until she found it. The coin was a Greek uh, drachma, uh, that's in the margin of your Bible, probably, and to Bible students, roughly equivalent to the Roman denarius, also found in our New Testaments, and both of which were essentially equivalent to the wage paid to a laborer for a day's work. Jesus says, notice carefully, that she has ten, uh, ten of them, almost certainly indicating that they were all she had. Or it may have been that they were her retirement fund or, or uh, her inheritance. The point he's making is that each is valuable to her. So the loss of one would obviously be a, a very serious matter. Her home is small. Uh, she had to light a lamp, uh, perhaps indicating she had no windows. Uh, and to make sure she still didn't miss the coin, she began 
uh, to sweep the house as uh, she searched. Isn't that something we'd do? Uh, sweep the floor in case the coin was lying somewhere undetected by the eye, but the broom would brush against it and the clinking sound would reveal it. It's a picture of a desperate search. <coughs> My wife and I have said, have done some traveling recently at one hotel. Uh, we were about to leave the room and go to dinner. And she began uh, to panic. She was turning over every scattered thing, sitting on the table, on the armoire, or what, not armoire, the things in the hotel room. Uh, she, she was opening and closing drawers and pulling back the covers of the bed, getting down on the floor and looking under uh, the bed. She couldn't find her earrings. And they were nice earrings that I had given her for a special anniversary. And they were nowhere to be found. They were meaningful to her, precious. And I could tell we weren't going anywhere <laughs> until, until she found them, which she did. I won't tell you where she found them. <laughs> You'll have to ask her yourself. <laughs> but she found them, and it made her happy. We all know what it's like to be confronted with the possible loss of something or someone uh, precious to us. I've told some of you this story before, and apologies for telling two stories in a row, but uh, when our children were younger, we took them on a vacation in New York City. And uh, naturally, we laid down the rules for what not to do, what to do in the big city, and also uh, for what to do if, we, if one got separated uh, from us. We were to meet in front of the hotel. It doesn't matter how you get there. You, the one thing you do, we meet in front of the hotel. So. Uh, we found ourselves on one of the days walking down the steps to a subway station. I saw one of the trains waiting and about to leave, so I picked up my pace. Make, you know, maybe it was the one we needed to get on, and if we missed it, we'd have to wait for a while. But so as, I, as I got close, uh, no, it's not the one, so I stopped. But Stanton didn't stop, the 12-year-old. He charged right on. The doors closed. The train takes off, Stanton waves bye-bye. <laughs> the, the sign on the subway, kid you not, reads 125th Street, Harlem. <laughs> and his mother burst into tears like that. Uh, to say the least, it was uh, the anguish of possible loss. But we didn't lose him. We found him uh, casually walking in front of the hotel with his hand in his pocket. I think he was whistling. He was <laughs> totally relaxed. Those kind New Yorkers had taken him under their care and directed him there. Well, those are good feelings. Uh, the lost child was not just any child. He was our child. And here the woman in the parable uh, went from despair at her lost coin to the joy of finding it. And uh, look in verse 9. I just pulled a President Biden on you. Look. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> look in verse 9 at what she does. It gives us a, a key connection to the previous parable. She calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. The shepherd, in verse 6, did the identical thing. He called together his friends and neighbors and called them to rejoice with him because he had found the sheep which was lost. 
When you find repetitions like this in the Bible, you pay attention. Uh, what Jesus was saying was, the lost found is a reason to have a celebration and share the joy with those who are close to you. And we're going to see that again, as you know, in the next parable. In the final verse, uh, Jesus reinforces the application. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God rejoices and those in heaven with him when a single sinner repents and finds salvation from the hand of the one who would not relent until he was found. If the angels long uh, to look, as Dan reminded us last week, and into the glories of heaven, their longing gaze is rewarded when one of the shepherd's sheep is found, when his precious belonging is recovered, and as we'll see in the remainder of the chapter, when a wayward child falls at his feet. It's the main point of the passage. We all begin as lost sinners, but God searches us out. I recently read through the book of Acts. Some of you have too, I know. And come, uh, coming to the 13th chapter, I read of uh, Luke and, uh, Luke's account of Paul and Barnabas' uh, first missionary journey. And they made their way eventually to Pisidian Antioch. And they were invited to address the meeting of the synagogue there, uh, filled with a congregation of God's lost sheep. And they preached Jesus uh, to them. Paul explained their mission. This is interesting. He explained their mission to them. He said, to us, the message of this salvation has been sent let it be known to you that through this one, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Well, you may not remember, but the reception was mixed. It was, you know, they didn't storm down the aisles, uh, but they were given another chance to proclaim the gospel the following Sabbath. And Luke records in verse 48 of Acts chapter 13 that as many as had been appointed to eternal life uh, believed. The lost were found that day. The Lord had sent Paul and Barnabas to find them. I was reading a couple of months ago some correspondence from one of our missionaries. Uh, some of you perhaps read it also, and he described uh, one particular uh, day's work, as this is what he called it, my assignment from the Lord. Uh, there was a pastor and his wife who were under considerable duress on account of their testimony in the midst of their, this country's malevolent regime. He, he, the pastor had developed a, a very serious uh, disease, but he was unable to purchase the med medicine he needed because of a lack of money in this oppressive environment in which they lived. And our missionary uh, came seeking him cash in pocket and showed up at their door unannounced. Uh, the pastor uh, was but one uh, suffering sheep, uh, but the Lord was intent, it was intent on helping him. And, to, and so our missionary brother's assignment. After their happy reunion, the pastor revealed that the very morning at breakfast, he had told his wife, the one person who has been coming to help us probably will not come anymore because of this tenuous environment. But he did come. Uh, the surprise visit was yet another indication that the life of one person redeemed by the blood of our Savior is of incalculable value in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. And so said our missionary friend. Of course, Jesus was uh, with the sinners. That's where the elect are found, <laughs> with, with the sinners. If you're an elect believer, a son of God, 
Where were you when he found you? You were with the sinners. I was. And there's joy in heaven when one sinner repents. That's every man and woman's experience who has come to Christ. We are not lost to him, and he knows us all by name. He is the Lord of the universe who has sent his son to this earth to seek and to save that which was lost. And so joy to the world. The Lord has come. And heaven and nature sing. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. And there is joy in heaven. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for the joy that you find in saving us. Thank you for the uh, thank you that you love uh, to save sinners. Thank you that you love that so much at great sacrifice, as we're about to hear in the ministry of the word, at great sacrifice, uh, you uh, gave your son to be an atonement for our sins. May we have uh, your spirit. Uh, may we uh, have a heart for lost people and, and find them and give them the message of salvation. We pray, that's what happened to us. That's what happened to me. And Lord, uh, it is our obligation to shepherd in that way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.